case you are here for the first time or you've never been to one of these before. Uh, these are these things called theology talks that we've done for a couple of years now. Uh, just really seeking to bring a biblical perspective to see really what does God uh, think about some of the the topics that are out in culture today. So they're basically 30 to 40 minute just talks about what's going on in the world today and how can we just think biblically about it. Uh, as I mentioned last week, over the last few years, we've done LGBTQ, sanctity of life, comparative religions, deconstructing your faith, politics, Marxism, gender identity, and more. And then for these uh, weeks, uh, we're looking at church and the culture, living for God in an anti Christian culture, and so we talked last week about the importance of really having good cultural exegesis and being able to discern what's going on in the culture and how does that impact how I just uh, live out my faith, be a good witness, and be a good uh, parent as well. And we talked last week about how there's been a shift in culture's view towards Christians and Christianity. So pre-1994, it was positive. Uh, between 1994 and 2013, it was neutral. And then from 2014 to the present day, it's negative. And so we need to be prayerful and wise in, in how, we, how we navigate that. Today, uh, we're talking culture in the church, the dangers of something called progressive Christianity that is creeping its way into the church. And then next Wednesday for our third and final theology talk, we will talk about artificial intelligence. How should a Christian think and feel about that? So talking AI next week. But today, culture in the church, the dangers of progressive uh, Christianity. The word church uh, is a translation from the Greek word ekklesia. This isn't a film, but if you want to write it down, it's E-K-K. L-E-S-I-A, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. And it literally means in assembly or called out ones. And so the root meaning of church is, is not that of a building, but a group of people. Paul himself in Romans 16, 5 says, greet also the church that meets in their house. And so while people typically, when they're referring to to church, they think of a building. It's actually a, a body of believers with Christ himself as the head. Ephesians 1, to 23 says that God is the head of the church. And so biblically speaking, when we think of the church, we should think of both the global church as well as the local church. So the global church is everyone everywhere who has a personal relationship with Jesus. This would be the global church, everyone who has received Christ is part of the, the global church. The local church is just a localized ministry. Paul, Paul wrote letters uh, to local churches uh, throughout the, the New Testament. And so the challenge for believers today is that we are seeing pastors and leaders adopting unbiblical beliefs and couching it as Christianity and as the church using some, some new terms. And so I do think it's important that we just, as a community of faith here at Stone, uh, really uh, watch out for just false teaching that is in the world today. And I do think it's biblical, Matthew 7, 15, says to watch out for false prophets because they appear as sheep, but are as ferocious as wolves. And, and, and again, this goes back to biblical times. Christianity had barely gotten off the ground. Uh, before false teaching began to just infiltrate the church. In fact, as we read the New Testament, there's a, a lot of alerting Christians to the dangers of false teaching that was going on uh, in those local settings. One current false gospel movement that is prevalent today is something called progressive Christianity. And so I do think that we need to expose this and talk about it uh, so that we are aware of it because it is dangerous. In fact, I want to show you just a quick one minute video from Elisa Childers, just that she speaks just for a moment about the dangers of this. I think it's dangerous because, first of all, it's really infiltrating the church. It's something that on the lay level is so massively influential right now. I, People may remember the emergent church. Do you remember when people were talking about the emergent church in the early 2000s? I actually don't. Okay. No. 
Well, this is kind of the time when guys like Brian McLaren were emerging. Uh, this is kind of when Rob Bell was writing Love Wins and, and people like John Piper were tweeting farewell Rob Bell and they kind of pushed all of that out. But what ended up happening is the emergent church didn't go away. It just kind of was forced underground. In fact, Brian McLaren, again, a, a major player in that movement, wrote in a blog post in 2012, the emergent church is not gone. We just don't call it that anymore. And he says, you know, we might use the word progressive or missional, but it's this new way of looking at Christianity. And so in, in my observation of more recent history, I've seen the emergent church kind of go away and that nobody's talking about it anymore, but it's reemerged more influential than ever, but it's calling itself progressive Christianity now. And, and so it's, it's dangerous, first of all, because of how influential it is. It's dangerous also because of the beliefs that the movement is bringing into the church. So my, Michael Kruger wrote a book called The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity, which was very helpful. Alyssa Childers, who you just saw right there, has written and, and talked a lot on uh, this topic. Sean McDowell has some podcasts on it as well. So they were all very helpful sources for this. And so what would be a definition of progressive Christianity? Progressive Christianity is a current theological movement that is rooted in liberal theology, which rejects the fundamentals of the Christian faith, denies the exclusivity of Christianity, and emphasizes social justice and tolerance. And so while the current expression grew out of the emerging church from the 1990s and the early 2000s, really this is nothing new. In 1923, J. Gresham Machen, who was a professor at Princeton Seminary, uh, he wrote a text called Christianity and Liberalism, and the book was in response to the rise of liberalism and the mainline denominations of his own day. And in it, he argued that lib a liberal understanding of Christianity wasn't just a different denominational perspective, it's actually an entire different religion or faith. In his mind, liberal Christianity is not Christianity. And what's incredible is how spot on he was. His description of liberal Christianity was this moralistic, therapeutic version of faith that values questions over answers and being good over being right, and that is still around uh, for us today. We see this in the early church and Gnosticism from Marcion to modern day prosperity preachers, and there's really no end to it. And so really, it, it has new names like emerging or progressive, but it's the same false teaching that's been around really for generations that just they want less Moses and more, more Oprah. So progressive Christianity is both challenging and dangerous. And this is really important right here, you guys. What makes progressive Christianity as a whole so challenging is it is a, it is a master class in half truths. It's a master class in half truths truths that their, their beliefs can sound almost appealing on the surface until you dig deeper. And even as we talk about these, we'll talk about 10 different traits of progressive Christianity. Most of these come from progressive Christianity themselves. And as you hear them initially, you're going to think, well, that, that didn't sound too bad, but, but they're just half truths. And when you dig deeper, you find that they're just rooted in, in complete uh, teaching that is outside of the Bible. And so what makes it so dangerous is that this has infiltrated churches who really are willing to redefine the historic uh, doctrines of the Christian faith. So 10 descriptions or beliefs of progressive Christianity. Number one is this, progressive Christians redefine biblical words. And this is super important. Progressive Christians redefine biblical words. They participate in what is called linguistic theft. So you may ask a progressive Christian, what well, do you believe in, in, in hell? Or do you believe in the doctrine of inspiration? And they're gonna say, totally, I totally do. But what we need to understand is what they mean by hell or the doctrine of inspiration is very different from what I would believe or we would believe about hell and the doctrine of inspiration. That they, they may feel, well, hell is just really reaping consequences for harmful decisions that you make on earth. 
And in their mind, that's what they describe as hell. They, they may think of inspiration as well in the same way that LeBron James is inspired as a basketball player or Michael Jordan is inspired as a basketball player or there's a certain author that can write inspiring literature. That's how they view. So, so you may walk away thinking, well, we believe the same thing, but we don't because they redefine biblical terms. And so we need to be aware of that. So it's a very, very, very similar challenge as when you're having a conversation with a Mormon or a person who's a Jehovah's Witness, right? That there can be the appearance that we agree, but when you get deeper and define the terms, the beliefs are very different. That's why Sean McDowell, when he had a progressive pastor on, he talked about, he said, let me give a 30 second definition on who I believe Jesus to be, and then why don't you give a 30 second definition on who you believe Jesus to be, and you almost need to go to that length to understand what they mean and how it differs from, from what you mean. So they redefine biblical terms. Number two is progressive Christians believe that following Jesus can lead to an awareness and experience of the sacred, oneness and unity of all life. So this has been borrowed from Eastern and New Age thought. Progress, progressive Christians would believe in panentheism. Now, now, let me give you a couple of definitions here. Pantheism is the worldview that the universe is God or God is the universe. God is soaked into everything. That's pantheism. Panentheism believes that when God created the world, he incarnated himself into it. So they would believe that God is part of the universe, similar to how a hand fits into a glove, and that God is the supreme effect of the universe. And so events and changes in the universe actually change God. As the universe grows and learns, they would believe God increases in his knowledge as well. Well, obviously this is not biblical at all. It degrades the character of God and makes him more like a man. The Bible says that God is present everywhere, but God is not everything. He doesn't infuse himself into trees. God is omnipresent and cannot be contained by physical matter. And so he is everywhere at the same time. And yet he is also transcendent in that he is separate from creation. You might jot down Psalm 139, 7 to 8 would be a scripture for that. Psalm 139, 1 through 6 teaches that God knows everything and does not need to learn because he has all knowledge. So, so God is affected by actions that happen in our universe but only in that sin angers him and holiness pleases him, but our actions do not change his essence as God. So this is super important. Uh, along with that, progressive Christians would believe that Jesus is a model for living more than someone to worship. That Jesus is a model for living versus someone to worship. They don't believe that Jesus was divine. They believe that Jesus was a good teacher. Philip Goley, in a book that is, that is foundational for pro progressive Christians, he rejects the virgin birth, rejects the sinlessness of Jesus, and rejects the miracles of Jesus as myths designed to elevate Jesus to a divine status. I listened to a podcast where a, a leading a progressive Christianity pastor proclaimed that Jesus sinned while he was on earth. From, that's, that's from a progressive Christian pastor. So th this would fully reject one of the core doctrines of historical Christianity, the, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so liberalism regards Jesus as an example or a guide, whereas Christianity sees Jesus as our savior. Now, obviously, Jesus is our supreme moral example, but he is so much more than that. So let me give a couple thoughts from a Christian perspective on that. Uh, number one, throughout the gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus is presented as not just a good teacher, but as divine Lord of heaven and earth. We see this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, passages in John, John 1, 1, John 1, 18, John 8, 58, John 10, 30. And secondly, 
Jesus' followers worshiped him as Lord. So while progressive Christians are hesitant about worshiping Jesus, that is not how the early Christians felt at all. They viewed Jesus as Lord and they worshiped him. And here's the kicker. They did this while also being fully committed to monotheism, that there's one God. So they worship Jesus while being fully committed to monotheism. They worship Jesus as the true God of Israel. The Magi worshiped him in Matthew 2. The disciples worshiped him in Matthew 14. Uh, the, the disciples worshiped him after the resurrection. The man born blind worships Jesus in, in, in John 9. And then the angels worship Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. And so here is what would be troubling about progressive Christians' belief and their take on things where there's some, some inconsistencies, it's this, that they want to make Jesus their moral example, but what's missing in their system of belief is why anyone should care. Now, let, let, me, let me describe that. If they view Jesus as simply another man, why does his moral code matter more than any other person? If progressive Christianity, in progressive Christianity, morality is relative, and so in their mind, why does Jesus get a pass? They might say Jesus has moral authority because he is divine uh, and, and he's a prophet from God, but they would only know that from scripture, which raises questions, which we'll get to in a little bit, about how they view the scripture. Many progressive Christians deny the inspiration of scripture and if scripture is unreliable and uninspired, how do they know that Jesus was a prophet? And if some accept the inspiration of scripture, why not accept the plain teachings of scripture that Jesus is divine? And they will also re uh, reject some of Jesus's plain teachings like marriage being between a man and a woman, Matthew 19, or his teaching that he is the only way to heaven in John 14. So Michael Kruger stated that by removing the divinity of Jesus, it essentially makes Christianity a religion of moralism and that what matters most is not doctrine or theology, but behavior. And that is very contrary to historic Christianity, which is all about grace, right? It isn't about what we do. It's about what Jesus has accomplished for us. Number three, progressive Christians view the teachings of Jesus as one of many ways to experience the sacredness and oneness of life. So this is very important. Progressive Christianity is non-exclusive, meaning they don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. They don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. So he, he is one of the ways but he is not the only way. They would, they would believe that other religious traditions have found their way to God and we can learn from them as well. So that's how a progressive Christian would, would view that. They would also believe that it's not our place to say who is going to heaven and who is not. And so here's what a progressive Christian pastor said. I do try to hold a pretty big tent for the term Christian, I am nobody's gatekeeper. So that, that's what he said. So they would have a belief similar to, you, you know when you pull up your phone to go to a destination, you put in a, an address and you typically get two or three different routes of how to get there and you get to pick which route you wanna take to this location, to this restaurant, and we just pick it. Well, that's wonderful for getting to a restaurant, but it's horrible theology. There, there, there's, there, 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 there's one way, there, there's one path. And so really progressive Christians would believe in universalism, right? This is kind of a, a common thing that, that everybody is saved and the concept of hell is not a reality. So what would be some Christian thoughts on that? None of that is biblical. None of that is biblical. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that Jesus is the only way to God. All right, now let me give you, let me read some scriptures that you might just wanna jot down. John 14, six, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, eight through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, 
rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called into account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Matthew 7, 13 to 14, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So Jesus is not one of the ways to get to heaven. He is the only way to get to heaven, and the Bible makes this abundantly clear. Four, (laughs) thank you. Number four, (laughs) progressive Christians seek a community that is inclusive of all people, including, but not limited to, conventional Christians, questioning skeptics, believers, agnostics, men and women of all sexual orientations and gender identities. So it would be very common, very common in the progressive community to be an agnostic and still identify as a progressive Christian. There's actually an online progressive church that is co-pastored by a progressive Christian who's an atheist. So progressive Christianity rejects biblical sexuality and affirms same-sex marriage and premarital sex. They would believe that God doesn't care what happens in the bedroom as long as your heart is in the right place. Progressive, there's a Lutheran minister, Nadia Boltz Weber, progressive, argues that a new Christian sexual ethic should emerge that allows for these things, moderate pornography, one night stands, same sex encounters, and virtually any sexual activity that demonstrates, quote, a concern for each other's flourishing. And so really, according to this false doctrine, human sexuality is based simply on what makes someone feel happy rather than holiness and God's plan for for sex. Uh, Another aspect of this, would be a very hostile language to anyone who holds traditional views or biblical views of of sexuality. So what's some, just some Christian thoughts on that? Here's what we need to know. All of Judeo-Christianity, thousands of years of Bible scholars and hundreds of years of Bible commentaries are united in their position that homosexual behavior is condemned by the Bible. Why? Because God's laws are always, always for our protection and well-being. And this is super important. It's much like driving down a highway and there, there's the guardrails or those, there's those little bumps on the side of the freeway. If you start to kind of merge over, you, you hear that sound. The, these are warning signs and guardrails to keep us moving down the right path. And this is what God's word is for us. His laws are for our protection and for our well-being. And so in in every conversation about the Bible, this is super important, no matter what we're talking about. It's important that we practice what is called exegesis and not eisegesis. Let me give you those definitions. Eisegesis is an approach where we insert our own ideas and preconceived ideas into what we want the Bible to say. So let me say that again. It's an approach where we insert our own ideas and our preconceived ideas into what we want the Bible to say. If we go to the Bible looking for something we want it to say, we can find it. You can misinterpret scripture and make it support almost anything you want it to. And so you will find people practicing eisegesis who will say Genesis 1 to 2, 
was not meant to apply to every social relationship. That 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is a verse about prostitution and not homosexuality. You will hear that. But those are clear examples of eisegesis. Exegesis is what we want. Exegesis is an approach that pulls information from what the Bible says. You are trying to learn what it means by reading what is actually there. So that's exegesis. So exegesis is super good. Eisegesis, super bad. So there's no way any unbiased Bible student can come away from the Bible with the conclusion that it does not condemn homosexuality because of God's, God has a plan. Genesis 1, 27 to 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So right here we find biblical basis for why homosexuality is wrong. Here's a couple things. Number one, it goes against God's created order. God created male and female and blessed them. So, so he didn't bless a male with a male or a female with a female. So homosexuality goes against God's created order and his blessing on the male-female union. And then secondly, what is called the dominion mandate. This is the command that God says to be fruitful and multiply and, and fill the earth. In homosexual unions, that is not possible because there are no kids who can carry out this command of God. The only way to subdue the earth is to have kids and homosexuality would stand in the way of that. Number five, progressive Christians believe that the way we behave towards one another is the fullest expression of what we believe. Now again, you hear that at first glance and that sounds okay, right? It sounds, that almost sounds good. But we have to understand that in progressive Christianity, what you do is much more important than what you believe. What you do is much more important than what you believe. They would believe that theology doesn't matter. That, that, that's why you'll have one progressive Christian who believes in the resurrection and another who doesn't. In their mind, that's all good as long as you are also looking to tear down systems of, of oppression. They don't have to agree on doctrinal points in, in progressive Christianity. Roger Olson wrote an article on this and he talked about this, this influential a seminar, seminary a professor and theologian, he went to hear him speak. And he didn't know anything about him except for his reputation as a Christian scholar. He was there at this university. There was hundreds of students and he was promoted on campus as a Christian worth hearing and taking seriously. And halfway through his talk, he mentioned, this is a Christian scholar, so to speak, that he is both Christian as well as a Buddhist. And this made Roger Olson perk up. And he watched as seminary students were drawn in to hear more because they were intrigued. And so here was this speaker and professor from a well-known Protestant seminary who went on to explain that he was finding great personal and spiritual help through involvement with a Buddhist sect from Japan, and he argued that there's no conflict between that and Christianity, right? So again, just for the record, Buddhism is not Christianity. The Center for Progressive Christianity was founded in 1996, and in their survey, here's what they said. Traditional understandings of Christology, which is the study of Christ, study of Jesus, atonement, which is Christ's death on the cross that offers forgiveness, Incarnation, God becoming flesh, are all in flux. In fact, many people find these concepts to be irrelevant to contemporary spirituality. So you understand, so, so okay, can we read between the lines there, right? Okay, beliefs don't matter, doctrines don't matter. So here's, here's just some Christian thoughts. If we're not careful, Christianity can be so compromised that it loses its meaning and becomes something completely different all while still being called Christianity. 
So the Bible teaches that beliefs matter. John 1.12 says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, right? He gave the right to become children of God. Romans 10.9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, again, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the Bible says that, that we put our faith in Jesus and we're saved through that faith and belief in Jesus. Number six is progressive Christians believe that there is more value in questioning than in absolutes. There's more value in questioning than in absolutes. That this is a, a very popular uh, characteristic of progressive Christians. They are on a perpetual question asking journey and you ask questions not because you want to know answers, but because you want to get to the next question. Does that make sense? It's a perpetual question. So you ask questions not because you want to know the truth, but because you want to get to the next question. In progressive Christianity, if you express certainty on a certain theological point, you are viewed as not as enlightened yet. Now, I do believe that the church should be a place where people can ask honest questions. I, I fully believe that this is an area where the global church and our church can do better. We need to have a space for people to ask and, and questions and wrestle with that. Okay, we've got something I've just been really grateful that we've done in the last year or two is people can text in Bible questions to our text line and, and one of our pastors answers it and gets back to them because we need to be a, a community of faith where you can ask those questions that you're trying to kind of get your head uh, around. So we, we need to be uh, better at that. The, different, the difference is that uh, progressive Christians view truth as intellectually irresponsible. They would believe that we cannot be certain about what we believe and that truth is not accessible. So here, here's a Christian answer. Uh, I don't know is not always the right answer. Sometimes it's the wrong answer, right? I don't know is not always the right answer. Sometimes it's the wrong answer. And again, here's where you would find progressive Christians being inconsistent. They would be quick to condemn behavior that they see in the world around them while simultaneously claiming that Bible-believing Christians are wrong when they do it. So think for a moment about same-sex marriage. You, you don't hear too many progressive Christians say, well, we don't know the answer to that. We don't know how to feel about that. We can't be certain what to think about that. No, they are very certain what they think about that. So they've certainly swapped one set of certain beliefs for another. We all have things that we're certain about. The key question is, what do we base our certainty on? So a progressive Christian bases their certainty on feelings and culture. Christians base their certainty on the Word of God, on, on the Bible. Number seven, progressive Christians strive for peace and justice amongst all people. So th this is another example where we need to define terms. Uh, again, I, I think we sh as Christians should, should seek peace and and justice, but we have to understand that in progressive Christian, Christianity, when they say the word justice, they're not talking about biblical justice. For them, justice means equal outcome for all people. So anything where people might come out on the other side with differences in what they receive is now defined as unjust. Let, let me say that one more time. Justice for them means equal outcome for all people. So for them, anything where people might come out on the other side with differences in what they receive is defined as unjust. Well, that is not the biblical definition of, of justice. So we, we know from the Bible, from what the Bible teaches about the judgment seat of Christ, that there will be different rewards in heaven. We read about the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, verses six through 10. Number eight is this, progressive Christians strive to protect and restore the integrity of the earth. Now, I, I do think that there's, it's good to care for where we live, but again, in progressive Christianity, panentheism is so key 
that if you believe that the universe is literally the body of God, then environmentalism becomes a gospel to you. And that's why environmentalism is so important to a progressive Christian. So how, how should a Christian view environmentalism? Well, here's a couple of thoughts. Number one, anchor in the Bible. I do think that God has blessed us with a planet that gives us all we need to eat for life, eat, you know, clothing. So we should appreciate the functionality and the beauty of, of the planet. We're called to care for and manage the resources that God has given us. We see in the Old Testament uh, when the land was given a year of rest on, on the seventh year. But the closest biblical example that, that could be considered climate change would be end time events in Revelation 6 through 18. And when we look at those passages, they have nothing to do with greenhouse gas emissions, but are the result of God's sovereign will and plan. Number two, remember that this world is not our home. 2 Peter 3, 7 through 12, Revelation 21, 22 say that our current universe will be replaced with new heavens and new earth. And so we do need to ask, just ask the question of how much effort should be placed in saving a planet that will be replaced with something amazing. Number three is maintain biblical priorities and perspectives. Uh, again, there is no problem at all with having solar panels and windmills, that's awesome, that's amazing. But as followers of Jesus, this should not be our primary mission or message. As Christians, the gospel is always our priority in our perspective. Uh, number nine, uh, progressive Christians commit to a lifelong uh, learning, compassion, and selfless love. In progressive Christianity, here's what, how love is defined acceptance, affirmation, and the celebration of whatever anyone wants to do or behave like. Love is defined as acceptance, affirmation, and the celebration of whatever anyone wants to do or behave like. Again, this is not a biblical definition of love. Biblical love is defined in 1 Corinthians 13, and one of those characteristics is in verse six, where it says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Number 10, progressive Christians reject the Bible's authority. This is, you guys, this is a, a hallmark of, of progressive Christianity. And this is something that, that if I'm being straight, you. You, as you listen to people or read people, you'll begin to kind of see this, a lowered view of the Bible. And when you begin to see a lowered view of the Bible, alarms should go off in our heads. It is, a, it is a warning sign that they may be going down this road. So progressive view scripture, not as perfect and divinely inspired, but as a primarily human book that contains contradictions, errors, and inconsistencies. Because of this, biblical authority takes a back seat to one's personal conscience as the highest authority on earth. Uh, one of the progressive leaders is Brian McLaren, and he suggests that we should change the way that we read the Bible. Instead of viewing it as an authoritative source for truth, he recommends that we read it as an inspired library that preserves the best attempts of our spiritual forefathers to understand God in their own culture and times. He actually compares scriptures with fossils to be dusted off and observed rather than a revelation from God that should be obeyed. Uh, uh, here, here's other progressive leaders put it like this. The Bible is the witness of generations of faithful people recording their own understandings of the divine in their particular time, place, and culture. This theological pluralism reveals changing, developing, and sometimes conflicting ideas about God. Again, this is why it, it, as, as, as Christians, we need to kind of be looking for these, these subtleties. Oh, the Bible is, it's, it's developing, it's, it's emerging. We need to be aware of these things. Here's, here's some Christian thoughts about this. And, and to be honest, we're gonna talk more about the, the doctrine of inspiration in our Daniel series here 
uh, soon. But basically, the, the, the inspiration of Scripture is one of the bedrocks of evangelical Christianity. It, it's a bedrock. Here's a couple of Scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scriptures God breathe and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So Scriptures God breathe, okay, inspired of God. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. We also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Second Peter 1, 21, for prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So really there are two views of scripture. Well, one view is, is that the scripture is either above us or it's below us, and there are only two. So progressive Christians put scriptures under their thoughts, their feelings, their opinions, and understanding. Christianity puts the Bible above us, over our head, where we submit ourselves to God's revealed word. So uh, let me just co close here with, with how can we counter progressive Christianity? Just what are some thoughts? I like this that I read. Uh, number one, uphold biblical authority. So the best way to guard against false teaching is to know the truth. And again, this is why as a church, we're asking God to help us to just be good stewards of his word, go through books of the Bible, memorize scripture, talk about what the Bible says about these things so we can really study and just uphold biblical authority in our own life, in our own family, in our own church. Uh, number two, stand for biblical sexuality and the sanctity uh, of human life. And so in, in many progressive circles, the entire Christian ethic of sex being enjoyed within the bonds of marriage between one man and one woman it's considered outdated and, and harmful, and even you get uh, abortion rights coming into that conversation. And so as followers of Jesus, we must align our view with what Jesus taught about sexuality and the sanctity of life. Uh, number three is have a strong backbone. Uh, it, it, I think it's possible that it, it, if we hold a Christian worldview, that you will be considered intolerant. I think that's very possible. And so the pressure to give in and to kind of just take a step back from biblical teaching can be there. But as followers of Jesus, uh, we need to just stand with Christ, stand with the scripture, even when it is unpopular. Uh, number four, live the truth. Again, live this out, live out God's word uh, that, that he has taught us. Uh, number five is, is proclaim the gospel. And so, you know, culture's ebbing and flowing, but we align and we teach the gospel. So how can we just kind of protect our teens from this just super quickly? Uh, number one, again, kind of a similar theme here. We need to train them in worldview issues. Uh, I think it's important that before our teens leave home, we have devoted time to examining anti-biblical views that are promoted and on social media and show our kids how much better a biblical worldview is. So I, I do think it's important that we need to like have some of these conversations and teach some of these things to our kids as part of their discipleship process so they're equipped to discern and kind of navigate the lies of, of culture. Again, with so much, they're be, them being confronted by so much, make them feel safe to express their doubts and questions. So as they're examining these things and they get this from school and all that, being able to kind of just have these conversations. Uh, number four is help them understand the correct view of faith. Again, is being anchored and rooted in, in, in God's word and in truth. And then lastly, number five is, is we, we focus on grace. It's the beautiful thing about about Christianity, it's not about what we do or earn or strive, but receiving God's gift of grace. And so guys, that is kind of one of the, one of the dangerous belief systems. And that's what kind of, uh, what just we were reflecting on that, you know, there are 
kind of perspectives in the culture that we need to be aware of. But again, what I'm also concerned about is culture is infiltrating the church. And so we need to be aware of these things and so we can just disciple our families well, be aware. And so we're not led astray, amen? Because we wanna be rooted and anchored and experience God's best for our life. So let's pray then next week is artificial intelligence. Come on, man, I'm excited about it. So artificial intelligence, so bring a friend. Lord, we just thank you that, that your word is alive and it's active. And Lord, we, we pray that you would help us as, as your sons and as your daughters to be aware of some of these dangerous beliefs that are out there. And it can be tricky when, when, when some of these terms are being redefined and some of these subtleties and half-truths. God, I pray that you'd give us just eyes wide open to see very clearly if there are teachers and false teachers and people being led astray. Would you help us to be aware of these things so we could stand for the true gospel? because we want to experience your best plans and purposes for our life. Lord, would you just give us wisdom as, as parents and grandparents as we seek to, to leave a legacy of faith. Help us to, to lead our kids and grandkids well, just to, at the right time, having right conversations, having these, these spiritually tidy conversations so that we can just see our kids just grow and flourish in their walk with you. And Lord, we also just pray, Lord, would you, for all those, those that are being kind of just swept up in this progressive Christianity movement, we pray that you would open their eyes, that they would see your, your plans for their life, that just, just the, the, the deception would be revealed to them, and that they would just see that, God, your way is the best way. So Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to be uh, people who make an impact for you, Help us to stand for truth so that you may be glorified in our life. And we thank you for these things in your wonderful and matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we love you guys, man. Thanks for hanging out tonight.